Jesus came, it says in Luke, and stood on a level place with two groups, the disciples and a great multitude. I'm going to cover the verse because this is what we talked last night about. Two groups, the disciples and the crowd. We know who the disciples are. Am I right? But who is the crowd? Huh? Who? Is it the Romans, the Greeks, the Gentiles? You think so? This is a tricky question. Don't answer. You get a C. It says there in the verse, if you look who they are, a great multitude from... Well, who lives in Judea and Jerusalem? Jew. The Jews. Not only, but in Jerusalem lived the priests and the Levites, those who served at the temple. So we talk about God's people. Moreover, we talk about Jerusalem, the leaders, and the Judea, the faithful. Okay? Two crowds, a small group, the disciples, and the big group, the rest of the church. We talk about the church not the Gentiles. Two groups. Now listen carefully. The disciples, they follow Jesus everywhere, every day. Am I right? The crowd, they came once a week, Sabbath, to church. Am I right? The disciples, Peter says, we gave up everything, jobs, families, everything, and followed you. The disciples, they surrender, sacrifice, give up everything. The crowd, they choose how much to give up, 10% or 5%. Should I give an offering? Should I help this evangelism and this work be? The crowd, they choose and pick what is comfortable, how much to surrender. You follow me? The disciples, they follow Jesus to serve, to bless, to sacrifice. The crowd comes to church to be blessed, to be fed the bread, and to be healed, and to be helped. Am I right? The disciples... They are ready to die for Jesus. The crowd, they kill Jesus. <laughs> you have two groups in the church. People who come to the church to be blessed and people who come to the church to bless. Those who come to the church to be blessed, they never get a blessing. And they always seek a blessing and always want another sermon and another sermon and another sermon. And they never seem to grow. <laughs> people who sacrifice for Jesus and they don't seek a blessing, they seek to be a blessing, they are those who grow. Are you the crowd or the disciple? Paul says, I consider all things. How many things? All, a loss. Ready to sacrifice all things for Jesus. He loves Jesus so much that he doesn't even think about seeking a blessing. He wants to sacrifice all, to be a blessing. He wants to give all. How many of us want to give all? That's how you measure Christianity. How much do you want to give? Because the more you give, the more you love Jesus. And the things that you cannot give and you have doubts and you, ah, should I? Those things are your gods. They are going to choke your relationship with God. They are going to keep you away from heaven. And those things burn. Satan gives you the impression that you need those things. But Satan knows that you actually need God. And when you pray for those things, you think that you have a problem. Man, I have a job problem. I have a family problem. I have a health problem. I have a school problem. No, you don't have a job problem. You have a God problem. Because Satan doesn't care for your job. Satan doesn't need a job. He has a job. Satan doesn't care for your car. He flies. Satan doesn't care for your school. He is already school, you know. Satan doesn't care for those things. He cares for your relationship with God. And he's going to keep you busy with those things so you have no time to focus on God. And the real problem we have is not those things that we pray for. is that we don't know God. Because when you know God... You trust that he will care of those things. You know that he loves you so much that he gave his life. How will he not also give you those things? And the more you are willing to sacrifice those things, the more God can work in you. And he promised, and God doesn't lie. He promised to give you those things. The problem is that we love self so much that we focus on things and go to God to get things instead of going to God to get God. And because we miss relationship, we miss faith, we miss joy, we miss a peace, we miss salvation, we miss everything. We are not Christians, we are the crowds. And very few go to heaven because they are the crowd. I mean, sorry, very few go to heaven because they are disciples and the others who don't, they are the crowd. Now let me explain. 
people come to church to be fed, to be blessed, to hear a sermon, to consume, to get benefits. They will never grow. God called us to serve. And the spirit of prophecy says, only by serving we become more and more like Jesus and we grow ourselves. And God doesn't, she says, God doesn't need us. He can use a donkey. Can he? Well, if God can use a donkey, he can use anybody. He can use Samuel. How old? When he called Samuel? Six. He can use somebody six years old? Are you kidding me? I remember we were on the train traveling from Bucharest to a different south, uh, city in the south, and our son was three years old. He had long hair, blonde hair. Mommy, please don't cut my hair. It's like gold. <laughs> OK, I can show you pictures. I mean, long hair up to here, our son. Mommy, please, I have hair like Jesus in pictures, except Jesus was not blonde. <laughs> and here we are, a three years old mind, and we try to explain him to be like Jesus is not the hair, it's the heart. Yeah, mommy, but Jesus gave me the heart, so it's Jesus' heart. Oh. I said, yes, but you need to, he will not get it. And then we are on the train. And there is a guy, because in that time in Romania, there was no law about smoking. And the guy in the same room in the train who smokes like a snake. And the whole compartment is, you cannot see people because of the smoke. And I, you know, and I, I'm trying to tell him to stop smoking. And she looks at me like, a, like, like the enemy. And I, ooh, what am I going to do? And our three-year-old son says, Daddy, you don't like smoke, do you? No, I cannot breathe. He says, did you talk to him? I said, no. I said, keep quiet. He can hear you. And the guy was going to sleep and waking up and taking another smoke and going to sleep. And Obi says, Daddy, but did you pray because you teach us to pray? I said, uh, no. He says, let me pray, Daddy. And I says, Jesus, help this man to stop smoking. And he prays loud. And the man wakes up and says, whoa, <laughs> three-year-old. And my son says, what, whoa? <laughs> And he says, you? How old are you? He says, three. <laughs> and I have hair like Jesus. And the guy says, what do you want? He says, stop smoking. <laughs> three years old, stuck into a 40, 50, whatever. Stop smoking. The guy says, I don't want to. He says, well, my son, three years old. You don't care to kill us. I understand that. Because you don't care about us. But don't you care about killing yourself? And my wife says, oh, you keep quiet. <laughs> and he says, mommy, you told us that Jesus can use us. Let me be used. <laughs> and the guy says, what? He says, don't you care that you kill yourself? And the guy says, no. If I want to die, I die. I says, do you have children? My son, three years old. The guy says, yes. If you die, who is going to take care of them? Do they go to an orphanage? <laughs> and the guy says, uh, never thought about that. And my son says, if you don't care for yourself, at least care for your children. <laughs> Three-year-old. And the guy stops and says, who taught you to say that? And the novi says, Jesus. <laughs> and then he says, we didn't tell him. <laughs> and the guy smiles and puts the cigarette down, stops it, opens the window, smiles, and then he gets tears in his eyes. Like he never thought about my kid that way. And the doctor told me I'm going to kill myself if I keep smoking day and night. And he stops. And then he says, give me your email. And then he emails us months later. And he says, I never touched a cigarette since. And he says, that three years old when he says, Jesus told me to tell you, he got to my heart. Mm -hmm. God can use a donkey. God can use a three-year-old. God can use a six. God can use the girl, the talk to Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army. You remember? A slave and a girl and young. God can use her. God can use stones. The Bible says if you don't talk, who will do the talk? The stones. God can use anybody, but God called you because that's the only way to grow. By serving, you develop character. You follow me? And so God called you. To do that. And the crowd comes to church to be served, and the disciples come to church to serve. And that's the reason we have sick people and healthy people in the church, because we have the crowd and the disciples. You know? God calls you to surrender all. 
rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? That's a bad question. You don't do to inherit. You belong to inherit. He says, what can I, I do to inherit? And Jesus goes to his sick church member mind when you think that you do to inherit. And Jesus says, okay, let's see. You go to church, yes. You eat broccoli, yes. You sing kumbaya, yes. You keep Sabbath, I never work on Sabbath. Okay, if you think that's the keeping of the Sabbath, it's about relationship. It's not about working, but okay. So you keep Sabbath, yes. You go to care meeting, yes. You teach Sabbath school, yes. You sing in the choir, yes. Wonderful. You know the 2,300 days and I prophecy, yes. <laughs> nice. Okay, you have done all, you should do it. But there is more. Sell how much? The man in the treasure sold how much? Sell all, and then follow me. And what did he do? So now I ask you, was he a good Adventist? Was he a good Christian? Why not? Because he went to church, he, you follow me? <laughs> he loved those things more than he loved Jesus. And the Bible says, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, everything. Sell everything. And to the degree that you sell, to that degree you can have Jesus. And if you are not willing to surrender, you don't have Jesus. And so, let me clarify something. By the way, do you see this picture? That's the way the clay containers were in under the house. There were two of them like this big, full of gold coins. But anyway, that's not the point. That's not a real picture from there because I was too young and I didn't, in that time, I, cell phones didn't exist, you know. But anyway, let me, let me go back to prayer. In uncounted places, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John, it says that Jesus would wake up when? Early in the morning, as long as it was still dark. dark. Thank you. You do know the verses, don't you? And he went out to a secluded place to pray. To pray. Many times, not once or twice, I counted so many times. I have the Bible verse. I have a whole sheet from top to bottom with verses that mention that. That Jesus would go out. And sometimes, not only that he went early in the morning, but sometimes he prayed the whole night. Really? If Jesus, the Son of God, needed so much prayer, how much prayer do you think we need? We need. And yet, while prayer should be a privilege, I mean, you get the chance to talk to God. Yet, for us, it's a chore. Man, I got to pray. How long should I pray, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, Jesus would pray early in the morning. Think about that. And the inspired books, the Spirit of Prophecy says that the secret of his strength was in his prayer life. Because prayer connects us with the source of power. And when you are connected with God, Satan has no access. And then there is a quotation that says, listen carefully now. Listen carefully. Because I'm going to ask you to repeat it. There is no limit. You understand the words no limit? To the one who puts self aside, sacrifices self. There is no limit to what God can do to one, one, anybody, anybody, Six year old, three years old, a donkey. There is no limit to what God can do through one, anybody or few. God can use you to turn the world upside down like a Moses, like to turn the world, the whole world, literally the whole world, upside down. Because God has unlimited, heavenly, unlimited, unlimited power. There is no limit to what God can do through one who puts self aside, sacrifices self, and makes room to the indwelling of the spirit in him until or in her, until God takes full control. The problem is not that God has limits. The problem is that we are fake Christians. We don't fully surrender because we don't fully love, because we love self. And we are afraid, if I surrender, what's going to happen to me? Because we love me. You, you follow me? <laughs> Instead of saying, I am not important. What happens to me is not important. I love him so much that I care what happens to him, not what happens to me. <laughs> and when you do that, God can use you in unlimited, unthinkable ways. God can turn the world upside down. I remember a very simple story, very simple story. 
uh, I remember, you know, my wife and I were talking, 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 talking about Cuba, about Africa, evangelism in Africa, evangelism in Cuba. They don't have money. They don't have not even a bicycle to travel from church to church to visit people. They don't have this. They don't have that. What should we do? And we looked and we said, we have so much left over. We have so much left over. We cannot do it. And then we said, we are building a house. We don't have a house. We sold our house. We purchased the property to be outside the city. And we don't have a house. We are building a house. And we got to the point that we need to order the windows. But the windows are expensive. Trust me, you don't know. I tell you, they are crazy expensive. And if you buy Anderson, the quality windows, people know what I'm talking about because they smile. You don't buy the cheap windows. You buy the quality. Man, they are ridiculous. I mean, for so many windows, you pay like eighty, ninety thousand dollars My son has a small house, and he needs only 19 windows. And Home Depot said to him, the cheapest that we have is going to be 24000 for 19 windows. The cheapest that we have, windows and labor to install. The cheapest, 24000 But when you talk about a small house, when you talk a little more, I mean, not three bedrooms, you talk about five bedrooms, and you don't want the cheapest. You know how much they are? And my wife and I said, what do we do? We want you to send so much to Cuba, so much to Africa, and we have nothing left over, not even for the windows, not even to, to survive for the rest of the month. What do we do? And my wife says to me, honey, windows are going to burn in the fire when Jesus comes. We really don't take the windows to heaven. Not even this windows, the computer windows, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking you know what computers we use in heaven? Mac or PC? It says in the Bible. God is going to open windows in heaven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So my wife and I talked and we said, we don't take the windows. She said to me, honey, we don't take windows to heaven. Let's put money aside for God. Let's sacrifice self. Do you think that's easy? No. Uh, uh, moreover, for me, because I am the guy who plans everything. And I, I spend time on a paper and I count the pennies and I plan, I do this and here I do and I swear. And then, oh, this is five cents short, you know, <laughs> I plan everything. I was in business for many years and trust me, it was a good business. <laughs> I'm not gonna go in details. So I plan everything. I used to be a lawyer, I used to be an engineer. Engineers plan. You know, and I took to I looked to my wife. She says it, the math doesn't work the way you say. <laughs> and my wife says, "Well, God doesn't do math the way we do." <laughs> and she says, "Think about the path." And instantly I said, "Yeah, you are right." So he said, "Okay, put the money aside for Cuba and for Africa, and we don't put the windows. Forget the windows. Forget the house." And we kissed each other. We had a prayer, and we left. And then our son calls from Tennessee. He says, Dad, the neighbor next to me is building a house. And I was in shock what windows he put. Not like the windows we see here. This type of windows from Germany that you can open them this way from the top, or you can open them from a side. And they have triple window, and they are tempered, and they are this way, and they are quality, and they are expensive. And I asked him, and you know how much he paid? He said, a fourth, one fourth of what you would pay if you ordered middle quality windows from here. I said, you're kidding me, tell me the name. He told me the name, I called the guy in Germany, I said, I have so many windows, these are the measurements, how much it? It was exactly shorter the money that we put aside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You follow me? And so we could do both and get quality windows from Germany. And I looked to my wife, and she looks at me, and she says, God is faithful. Amen. And he again and again says, I've seen it. I'm here. You put me first, and I'm going to show you that I love you. Isn't that something? So my wife and I have been in ministry for many, 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 many years. I don't know how many years. Uh, 27 plus 6. You do the geography, how much is it? The math. <laughs> anyway, 33 years more or less. Yeah, you do the geography. Yeah. <laughs> and so, in, since we came to, the, to this country, as soon as I finished Andrews, we purchased our first couch in America. 
kind of living room furniture. And we have been moving and moving and moving, and we had the same couch. And that couch, we have people over, the youth come over, and we have pathfinders come over, and we have the elders come over, and we pray together, and we plan together, and we, you know. And it says there, the quotation says, the reason for our lack of success in the church, the reason for our lack of success is that we trust too much human strategies and methods and too little the power of God. We plan too much and we pray too little. <laughs> and so, so my wife and I said, let's invite them over. Instead of having a board meeting and have five minutes prayer and two hours planning, let's invite them over, have two hours prayer and five minutes planning. Because I don't remember anybody in the Bible having a board meeting to, desire, to devise a plan like Joshua. We got to take Jericho. Let's have a board meeting and devise a plan. <laughs> you follow me? God gave him the plan. Mm -hmm. If you want God's blessing, you need God's plan. Anyway, so going back, invited them over. But every time you invite people over, guess what happened to the couch? So our couch, we had children over. I remember when they invited the whole church over and it was raining and this kid comes from outside and he's with a lot of mud and he doesn't take his shoes off and he jumps on my new couch that I bought Thursday and he jumps Friday, one day later. On my new couch, and I get red. My 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 face turned, my ears turn red, and I'm like, "You uneducated kid!" You know, and I'm ready to explode. And my says, "Honey, come in the kitchen." She knows when my ears turn red. She knows that I'm angry. Yeah. She saw my ears. I says, "Honey, in this moment, come in the kitchen." I was ready to bite that kid, you know. So I go in the kitchen. I say, "What?" And she says, "Your ears turn red. You are angry." I said, "I'm not." She says, "Yes, you are." I said. What's wrong with this kid and the mother? Doesn't she see the kid jumping on my one-day-old couch? <laughs> and my wife says, how much are you willing to sacrifice for Jesus? I said, everything. She says, the couch? I said, e yes. <laughs> and my wife says, honey, do you love the couch or love the kids? I said, the kids. But that doesn't mean that they should jump on my couch. And she says, honey, you don't take the couch to heaven. Sacrifice the couch. Jesus loved the kids, not the couch. Jesus, I don't remember dying on the cross for a couch. <laughs> and she says, honey, there is something wrong with your style of love. You say you love Jesus, but you struggle for the couch instead of struggling for people. Mm -hmm. She says, go in the backyard and pray for the people, not for the couch. And I kind of got the message. I went back. I said, Lord, please give me patience. So I stress for these people, not for this couch. And I'm ready to lose the couch. I'm ready to sacrifice the couch. We think we love Jesus, but I tell you, we just say it. But when something comes, we are not ready to sacrifice small things, more of our big things. And so I went in the backyard. I prayed. They jumped on my couch. After they left, my wife cleaned it. Next Sabbath, the lady comes to me and says, my husband left me seven, eight, nine years ago. I don't know how to educate my kids because they struggle between him and me. And I just point them and let them do whatever. And I knew you would just kill me. You would jump at me and call me names and be angry. But you are the most patient pastor I've seen. In my mind, talk to my wife. <laughs> and she said, you are a godly man because you didn't bite my kids. She didn't say those words. She said, you just loved him though he was ruining your couch. <laughs> From that moment, that lady would come and visit us and talk to us and I, we could work with her and her children and so on and so forth. And in my mind, it was worth losing a couch to get this precious soul. You follow me? Mm 